Wendy, I'm going to let you kind of introduce your background. Sure. But Wendy wrote Fearless and Free, How Smart Women Pivot and Relaunch Their Careers. And I thought this book was incredible. She has the most amazing stories and experts and she gets wisdom from some of the smartest people out there, including Shelley Zalas, of course. So, Wendy, how did, tell, get, tell me a little bit about your background sure. and how this came about. Oh, and I'm Laura Brownstein from Cosmo in 17 and the Shelley Zalas fan club. So, I mean, I say that I've pivoted so much in my career that I'm practically pirouetting. I have had so many different jobs. Um, and I've done so many different things. I started out on Capitol Hill. I was a press secretary. I moved into television. I worked at Dateline NBC. I worked at Fox. I worked at CNN. Then I wanted to get into the startup space, and I did that for a while. Then I moved into PR. Then I had a baby, and so I decided, well, how do you do have a baby and have a big career? So I'm going to write about that, and that was my first book. In any case, I've, I've realized that I've had to iterate and pivot many, many times, not always because I wanted to, sometimes because I've had to. And there was one experience in particular that prompted me to writing this book was I lost my job. I was working at Gray Advertising, and um, they brought me in to be part of this new content studio that they were creating. You know, but as things happen in, in things like advertising, there's no money to support it. And after six months, I was told, we're really sorry, but we can't afford you anymore. And I started panicking. I mean, I truly panicked. I was over 40, and I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do next? I really want to get into this content world because that's where everything is. People are losing jobs in my industries, in publishing, and in editorial, and in the television networks. But content, this is where everyone is. So I need to work at one of these bright and shiny startups that are popping up in New York City. And I started interviewing, and I, wherever I was going, I was interviewing with people who at this point were a lot younger than me. And I was trying to explain my story. And I would tell them about my background and what I thought was very interesting. And I always thought it was sort of impressive, you know, Capitol Hill press secretary. But I realized these, what I had done was not really resonating in this new world of, you know, these digital media companies slash um, content creators. You know, it wasn't working. And so after one particularly depressing interview, and I, I left and I walked out and I thought, I've got to like figure out my narrative. I've got to reown my story. I have to figure out what my brand is and how to sort of fit into that box and how to share my skill set in a way that's relevant to the people who are interviewing me. And that's really what launched the idea to write this book because you know, I think so many writers, we write about what we know. And in my case, I also write about what I need to know. And I started looking, I started digging into, you know, what are some themes? Where should we look for some answers? And I turned to Silicon Valley. I think they are our North Star. Mm -hmm. I call them our cultural crush. Everything comes out of Silicon Valley and the startup spirit. And I looked to the themes that, the, that are, you know, bubbling out from there and thought, how can women apply these ideas, like embracing failure? I failed so many times. Like, I, I know how to embrace failure, but how can we maybe apply that to our career? Other concepts like, engineering serendipity, creating our own magic, the power of female networking, which is what we're actualizing here in this room right now. Um, what are the different things? How do we brand ourselves in a way where we're not so squeamish? How can we do this successfully? So that really is a very right, long answer. We're going to get into that and break all that That's a long answer to your, okay. yeah, your initial question. All right, first of all, has anyone here ever pivoted their career? <laughs> okay, good. Has anyone here ever been fired? Yeah. <laughs> um, has anybody kind of had that moment of like, what do I do next and how do I make it work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how, what did you figure out? How did you learn to repackage what your skill set was so you could pivot your career? You know, such a great question. Um, I started really trolling LinkedIn. I started, so I really started looking to see what's out there. I mean, there's so much information out there for us, right? I mean, it's all really available, and the beauty of the internet is democratized everything for all of us. We can get access to everything that we need, pretty much. And I started looking at the jobs that I wanted to have to see what's the language being used, what are the backgrounds of these people, what's their experience, and how do I marry what I've done, and actually change what my resume looks like, change the wording, simple things like that were really effective. Like, I've never heard that advice before. I've edited career content at Cosmo for four years, and the <laughs> advice of go find the job you want on LinkedIn yeah. 
see what it, see what they say about themselves and then do that. Absolutely. So smart. Match it. Match How it. Else? It's out there. I'm a big believer in using social media and all those platforms to advance your career. What are some other ways that you can make that work? I mean, it's networking, networking, networking. We talk about that. That is what the essence of the girls' lounge is about. Um, it, it's about really empowering women to come together, to talk to people, to bust outside our little networks and meet other people. And I do write about this in the book, The Power of Networking. We think that you know strong ties are our best ties, but in fact, the opposite is true. There's mm -hmm. studies that are dating back to the early 70s that show that weak ties are actually your most powerful ties. And that is where you're, you know, you're really pushing outside your own comfort zone and you're meeting people who might have overlapping skill sets and overlapping industries, but not exactly the people you know. They're the ones who can hook you up with your next job. Yeah, your best friends are going to kind of make you feel better no matter what, but it's your acquaintances and casual friends right. that may open new doors for you. That's and that's something right. that I think takes a second logic-wise to realize. It does. And then the key to all of this is really confidence, right? So to even start this pivot, to start reaching out, to start making, you know, making network connections, you need to have this root of confidence, feeling good about yourself and being ready to take those steps. That's really what it all comes down to. One of the interesting things that you got into is the different ways we can kind of sabotage our own success and mm -hmm. subconsciously without even realizing it, you know, things we do that kind of hold us back. Right. What were some of the things that you came across? I talk about the way we present, right? There's been so much talk in the past couple of years about the sorries that women just throw into conversation. We use that sorry as a social lubricant, as a way to soften what we're trying to say, to hedge a little bit. And um, Any of you do that? The, sorry, does the sorry, sorry come in when you're like, want to bring up an idea? Sorry, Not I have an idea. So that's good. Okay, right. go well, on. And there's other shrinker words that you know we, we also are putting into conversation and putting into our emails, the just and the actually, the am I making sense? All of those words really diminish our power. They take back from what we're trying to say. And by the way, I'm really guilty of this too. And I write in the book, I talk not only about what we should do and what other women are doing, I talk about what I've done because I've been told that I was abrasive and I came across as like too bitchy and I got worried. I mean, we all want to be liked. So I started dialing back. I started hedging and dropping in those sorries into conversation at, in the workplace because I thought it made me softer, which it did, but it also made me a lot less sort of powerful. It really did take away from my power. Tara Moore of Playing Big has some, such good advice on managing that that you put in your book. Right. Um, how you kind of you want to talk about sure, it? Sure, so no. Smart. Yeah, no, it's really important. So here's the thing, and, and this also circles back to the double bind that women face. You know, that double bind is that women who come off and demonstrate those traits that are very strong and very, very powerful in leadership roles, they're not well liked in the workforce. Um, I mean, we saw it all playing out in the election with Hillary Clinton. Um, and then the women who come off as a little softer, a little nurturing, the ones who really hold on to those more feminine characteristics, they're not viewed as powerful leaders. So that's that conundrum that women face. That's the double bind. So what we can do, though, to, to still hold on to our power and seem direct and, and know what we're talking about is in an email, you start... You start looking warm. You start saying, how was your weekend? I hope that birthday party that you were throwing for your three-year-old was a fabulous success. Then get into what you want. So you start warm, you end warm. But in the middle, you are direct. And I would suggest, as Tara does and as others have out there have also suggested, scrubbing your email for all of those shrinker words, those just, those actually. There's even a Gmail plugin for the called Sorry Not Sorry that can sort of act as a spell check for your email. I found this to be incredibly effective. So you're editing yourself as you're going just to make sure that you're coming across warm but direct. And you do that in person as well. Smiling, obviously, body language. It's easier to come across warmer mm -hmm. in person than through an email, which, as we all know, has no tone. Such good advice. Tell me about kind of making your own luck and like the serendipity theory that you talk about in the book. Okay, so that is my favorite concept out of the book, this whole idea of engineering serendipity. I think that many of us think of serendipity as this happy accident, right? A relatively terrible movie with Kate Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> and that too. Um, 
some people we just look at as being really lucky, right? Like, why does, you know, Sarah always wind up with those, like, kick-ass jobs, or why is she always on television, or how, why is that always a great, you know, amazing piece of fortune happening for her, as if there's a halo over her, and, you know, you're thinking, woe is me, I can't move out of my, like, boring job, and nothing ever great happens for me, but actually, serendipity is quite strategic, and you can lay the groundwork for making things happen for yourself. And because I'm sitting here in the girls' lounge, I have to actually give a real-life example of my own serendipity when it comes to Shelly Zalas, um, who may not be listening. Hi, Shelly. <laughs> talking about my serendipity with you. So I was writing my book, and last March, I was at a bat mitzvah in New Jersey. As we do. As we do at this, at this age in my mm -hmm. life, in my children's lives, I go to bat mitzvahs, and I'm standing in a buffet line. And as I'm waiting in a long buffet line, I meet a woman who says to me, you know, wait, I, I know you, what are, what, are you a writer still? Is that what you're doing? And I was writing my book, and I, I'll be honest, I didn't feel like bragging about writing a book. The book wasn't done, you know, so I, I but at that moment I said, yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing a book. She said, what's your book about? I said, it's about women pivoting in their careers. And she said, oh my gosh, on Tuesday, you need to come to New York City because this amazing woman named Shelly Zalas is running this girls' lounge, and I am not even part of this event, but she is my fairy godmother, and she's helping me with my business, and you need to come. And I said, that's crazy, because I'm carrying around in my laptop bag a New York Times Styles article all about Shelly Zalas in the girls' lounge. She has been on my list of people to reach out to. I'm assuming she's so busy, I'm never going to get her on the phone, but that is crazy. I'm definitely going. So I went to the event. I walked into the room. This woman, her name is Gilly. She introduces me to Shelly right away. Shelly embraces me in a bear hug as if we've known each other for 20 years. And I said, I want to interview you for my book. And she said, we're going to make it happen. Talk to Talia. It's going to happen. Done. That's the answer to everything It's talk to Talia. Talk basically. to Talia. That is so actually there I the am. best career advice anyone could have. Talk to Talia. It'll happen. So there I was. I was seizing the opportunity. I decided to go to this event that this woman who I met for five minutes standing in a buffet line told me to go to. But now I'm actually sort of actualizing on that moment with Shelly. She's in my book. She gives me this phenomenal story. And, you know, less than a year later, or basically about a year later, here I am at South by Southwest in her girls' lounge talking about my book and talking about serendipity. So that we can create these moments for ourselves. It takes work. It takes laying the groundwork for ourselves. It takes confidence about actually asking and going and making a connection. And getting off the couch and just like getting, off getting the couch. yourself in places yes. where good things and good people will happen. That is, that is the key. And then making the moment and happen. And then the follow through. You have to close the deal too. Yeah. Right? And I think that... I know that for me, this book has very much been a personal journey of learning how to close deals. I'm not a natural networker. I mean, I just, I'm, not, I'm really not. I don't love to go to events. I would have to push myself. Also, living in New Jersey it means like getting on a train and going to the city often at night. I had little children at home. I didn't really want to leave them. You know, all of those types of things that women make excuses to hold us back, yep. but then you're off the radar. If you don't have visibility, no one knows what you're doing. You have to create those moments for yourself. And you have to um, give yourself a specific goal when you go to these events, I think. Um, yes. Wendy and I, we're going to talk in a second about that, again, about the power of female networks, because we are part of several, net we never met before, or we're part of several networks. And one of them, this group called The List, talks a lot about making the most of networking events. And set for yourself a goal. I'm going to leave yes. with three business cards. I'm going to meet, talk to five new people. Like, whatever it is, go in with a goal. And that way you can be like, did my goal, okay, good. And leave feeling successful, which I think is such good advice. Oh, I mean, to me, even flying to Austin is that exact experience. I have to think to myself, what am I doing here? I have a book, I'm obviously hustling my book, but what does that mean for me? What, what will make me feel like I made the most of this experience, this is what I'm taking away, these are the people I'm following up with, this will help advance what my goal of the moment is. Mm -hmm and really, really important, and I think it's really, you know, again, it goes back to the strategy. So when you walk into an event, it's not like, oh, gosh, who's here? Do a little bit of the research. Know who's going to be in the room. Know who you want to try to connect with and what you want to get out of that experience. Also know what you have to offer, right? I mean, this is not, you have to, you have to bring something to the table, mm -hmm. too. And when I say that, I'm not saying, like, 
it's, you know, you're swapping eggs for milk. But what you are showing is like what you can maybe help this person with or this business with, you know, what are they looking for that maybe you can show some added value. Yeah, you know, I write about getting comfortable in the uncomfortable. And so for your partner, that sounds like exactly what that is, right? So the more you do, the more you do, the more comfortable you get. You start mastering that skill. You start building that confidence. And then it, all of a sudden, you're not feeling so introverted. Or maybe you still are a, an introvert, but then when you need to sort of bring it, you can. And you can walk into a room and fake it. And look, there's, not, there's no shame in faking it until you make it. You know, I'm a big believer in that, too. I think many of us... You know, you're a little bit nervous, you're uncomfortable, you walk in, you start faking it for long enough until like you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. This remember, now makes sense. Guys don't think they're faking it. You know, one of the things that Wendy <laughs> right. talks about, it's an off sided study, it came up at a dinner I was at last night, that women only apply for jobs if they know 100% of the material and if they've been doing it for five years. Right. And men apply if they know 70%. I think it's even 60%. 60%. Right. And they're like, I got this. That's right. So, you know, you probably got that. They're willing to take the risk, right? So, so many uh, women, we struggle, we agonize over taking that risk. We want to be perfect. We want to make sure that we're not embarrassing ourselves. We're a little bit squeamish about going out there. And, you know, the fastest way to build that confidence is to take risks. And by the way, risk taking is different for all of us. So for your partner, it's coming to a networking event. It's probably like a deer in the headlights, absolutely no way. For someone else, it's public speaking. For someone else, it's writing. To show someone actually a piece of you know, written material, they don't think of themselves as a writer. So the fastest way to get over that is to take the risk in the area that you're feeling uncomfortable, which is really different for all of us. Anybody, anybody else have anything for Wendy? All right. Um, thank you so much for starting your morning with us. And seriously, check out her book, whatever phase you're in in your career. It's, there'll be something valuable and powerful to help you move forward to the next step in there. Oh.